Uh, so hi everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Tomer. I work at uh, Dell on PowerFlex, a distributed storage system. And uh, today I want to talk about something that is a topic which is uh, very basic on one hand, but on the other hand is kind of, I think, a knowledge gap. At least it's something that I never learned formally. And I think a lot of people also haven't. And uh, the evidence for that is the, a typical conversation that I often have. Um, you can imagine uh, this is like a Slack channel or something, and uh, some anonymous developer says, uh, hi, how are you? And so, yeah, fine, thanks, how are you? Um, so this, this uh, developer has a compilation error, uh, asking for help. And sure, yeah, why not? Uh, what's the error message? Um, the typing. <laughs> okay, this is the error. And also he says, uh, oh she, I added uh, the include for that uh, function that is an undefined reference and it is, doesn't help. So what's, the, what's wrong here? It's not a compiler. It's not a compiler. Actually, there are two things wrong here. First of all, all of these could be a single uh, message. So you can be polite, but also you know, just get to the point really fast. And the second problem here is that, yeah, it's not a, a compilation error. It's a linkage error. And basically, it doesn't matter what you're going to do with you know, includes. It, doesn't, it won't work, help because the problem is with the linkage. And uh, that's what I want to cover today. Well, not only problems, also good things. So what, what is a linker? Uh, we, have, we have a file. Well, let's say it's just main.cpp. We, we know there's a preprocessor, right? Uh, the one that uh, Bjarne wants to get rid of. And, uh, and then we have an object file. And uh, that is kind of uh, linked into an executable. So if you have just one final project, which is nice to have, uh, you might not even see all these intermediate, intermediate steps. You might just kind of jump from the source file to the executable. That's fine, why not? But you know, in a real life project, this main CPP probably includes some kind of header file, goose HPP, which you know, comes from a library called goose CPP, which also includes the same header file, which also gets preprocessed and compiled and linked. And also, the system libraries join in there, right? All the IO stream and everything. And uh, this last part, all these errors going to, into the executable, are what the linker does. So what is the linker's responsibility? Basically, it comes down to three things. It needs to lay out the code, lay out the data, and resolve the symbols between them. Uh, obviously, there are many uh, small details and important details, but you know, I think it, this is like the basic categories of things. Uh, what does that mean? Well, going back to this image, uh, you know, each one brings its own thing. The system libraries might bring the string class. Uh, main might bring the main function. And the uh, goose might bring some function uh, method goose talk, for example. Uh, so that's taking care of the, the code. Just, you know, put them in there, in the file, in the executable. Great. Uh, what about data? Same thing, basically. You know, system libraries also bring stdc out, which is some kind of object representing right, the standard output. And uh, Goose here bring, uh, brought the, the sound, which is some object representing the sound that the Goose makes. Uh, okay, so we took care of that, but now we have to resolve the symbols. All of these are kind of sitting in the same file, but they don't know how to talk to each other. And most likely, you know, main calls uh, goose, .talk, goose talk and Goose and also see out maybe. And goose talk needs the sound and also prints to see out and also maybe it uses a string and so on and so on. We need to somehow link between all of these. So that's about uh, resolving the symbols. And, uh, but you know, that's in theory. Let's now see it in action. Uh, let's hope it will work. You do not see it in action. Okay, so it will be very not nice if I don't remember the password. Okay, uh, so we have uh, just a small virtual machine with Linux because I like working with Linux. 
And uh, we have our project here. We have this main file, which initializes um, an object of type goose, and then it prints to see how the goose says, and then it calls goose talk, and then it says the goose shouts, and calls goose shout, and that's it. Um, let's look at the header, because I mean, that's what we include. So we have our goose class. And we have our methods, we have the constructor, and we also have it implemented here, right? And that will be defined. And we have also declarations for two methods, talk and shout. And also we have some uh, data here, and uh, this is actually a C17 feature. If you worked with older versions, you probably know that if you want to initialize some kind of static uh, data in your class, you need to declare it in the class, but then initialize it in your CVP file, and it's very annoying, and C17 resolved at least some of that annoyance. And with uh, C20, you can even put a string here, because in C20, strings can also be const, uh, compile time uh, initialized. But uh, well, with 17, we have the const char, which is good enough. And uh, as for the implementation, so we have the constructor here. But the actual function methods, the interesting ones, are in separate files. I put, just to make it interesting, talk in its own file and uh, shout in another one, and also it capitalizes because you need to use capital letters to shout uh, and print some exclamation marks. And uh, well, you know, let's just compile it and see what happens. So I have just uh, a script so I know script so I don't have to type too much. And you know, it's a simple project. We can just kind of compile all the CPP files, throw them into our compiler together, and get an output. Uh, which is you know, a nice program. You can probably already guess I have a one-year-old child at home. Uh, <laughs> we bring to the lectures what we have at home usually. Um, OK, this is what we expected. That's the, the, the program. But we want to learn about linkage. And this kind of hides all the details. So let's do something that is a bit more like a real project. So in a real project, we might compile each one separately, so we have this uh, dash C, which says to GCC, compile this file and bring out uh, an object file. And we do it to H1 separately, and then, again, in the last step, we just take all the object files and throw them into a single executable. And, well, it should work, right? Yeah. Okay, so, but now we have some more to work with because we have all the temporary files, well, intermediate files in the, uh, which were created before the linkage, all the O files, the object files. We can actually take a look at them to see what they have and what they don't have yet. Uh, one tool to do that is objdump, or just objdump for short. And uh, we can disassemble our files. So let's disassemble uh, the talk one. Okay, so we have, we have uh, a disassembly of section text, and the text is a linker speak for code. It's the same for the linker. Uh, and we have this uh, kind of thing here, which looks like a function uh, method. It says goose and it says talk, but it also has some kind of junk between them. And um, this is the first time we see uh, some effect of C++ coming to the picture. So C++ does name angling. Um, one reason is to resolve the issue with uh, multiple functions with the same name but different arguments. We can go back and do this again, but also pipe it through C++ Filt, which is a tool to change all the mangled names to the original names, demangled de sometimes called. And it just takes all the text and searches for the mangled things that look like mangled names and just unmangles them and you know puts out the same text. OK, so this is nicer. We have our function here. And OK, this is this assembly. You need to know assembly to actually read it. But still, even without knowing assembly, we can take a look at it a bit and see what we do have here. Um, I think this is the whole thing. Yeah, this is the whole thing. So let's see. Our function is this whole thing. And um, we have all the opcodes here. So these are all the opcodes. Like, this is the, what the machine reads. On the right hand, we have the disassembly. This is like assembly language, which us humans might be able to read with some you know, uh, persistence. And we have two function calls here, which are indicated by a call instruction. 
which makes sense if you look at our code. Well, maybe it makes sense. Uh, do we have two function calls here? We have, yeah, we have the shift left operator here, which is actually overloaded uh, for this for STDC out and uh, for class string and so on. So that's the function calls. But what's interesting is that the call doesn't say operator um, shift left. It just looks like it calls our function. That doesn't look right. If we look at the left side, we see that the opcode is all the zeros. I mean, we have the first byte of the instruction, which says it's the core instruction, but then the target is just zeros. And same for the other one. And that makes sense, because we still haven't connected it to the other one, to all the system libraries which have this. And the linker doesn't know yet. Well, the linker didn't run yet. But the compiler doesn't even know where that thing will sit. So it just left zeros. But it didn't just leave that. Yeah. That's a great question, because I was just about to answer that. <laughs> uh, that was not planned. Um, it does have a bit more information, and will run, will run objdump a third time, but this time we'll also add the relock flag. And relock adds all the relocations inside the disassembly. So we actually see that there are more than that, those two relocations. We actually have a bit more than that. Um, can you still see if I zoom out a bit? Yeah, this is, this is good enough, right? You see, let, let's just go to the first relocation here. You see this move instruction also had a bunch of zeros, but it also has, it's tagged as a relocation. Uh, a location of type x86, which makes sense, it's the Intel um, architecture, x86-64, it's 64 bits. And it's a uh, PC32, which is a kind of relocation. And the location at, um, address to put there is goose sound minus four. So what this means for the linker is eventually when this will be linked, it will take the, this address, this value, and just put it here in this, imagine an arrow like this, just put it there on the zeros. Now there are a, kind of a couple of subtleties here because the relocation is inside the middle of the instruction. The instruction starts at address 10, 10 hexadecimal, uh, but the relocation needs to be at address 13. And that's, that's okay, that's written there, it's written 13. Right, this is, this is 10, this is 11, 12, 13. Uh, that's good. But also we still have this uh, unexplained uh, minus four. And the reason for that is that the relocation here is a relative address. That's what the PC says. PC is the program counter. It's the address of the instruction. Well, actually, it's not the address of the instruction itself. It's the address of a register inside the CPU that points to the next instruction. By the time we actually read this instruction and execute it, the pointer already points to the next instruction, to here. So this, tells, this relocation tells the linker to put there where there are zeros that value, but also deduct four, because we need to account for the fact that the program counter already progressed to the next instruction. And that's just one type of relocation. We also have this other type here for the PLT type, for the core instruction, and also this, uh, I can't even pronounce this thing, for yet another uh, move. And, um, <clears throat> well, yeah, that's the basics, but now let's see what happens after we do the linkage. So I have, again, a script here because yeah, I'm trying to save some time. Uh, I just disassembled all the files, all the old files, but also the main file, like the final executable. And I want to compare the function talk we looked at before and after linkage. So you'll have to excuse me for not explaining this, but basically I just open, opening a compare uh, program, but also telling it to be smart about comparing, so we, we can compare. On the right side, we have the main. It's, it's huge, right, relatively. On the left side, we just have talk.o. Talk.o just, just has two things. It has, or maybe, maybe a bit more. It has the talk. It has um, some kind of, uh, I don't know, global sub, whatever. Um, 
and some kind of uh, static initialization destruction, which is kind of a helper function that the compiler outputs. But let's look at talks. So we should, we know what we expect, right? We expect all the zeros to become actual values. So the first thing is the, the address of the function. It was zero. Now it got some other address. This is actually the address that if you later run the program in a debugger like GDB and ask the address of the function, the method, it might actually print this out. Of course, it depends on the OS and the environment and everything. But this is kind of a linear or virtual address that the program actually will run in. And uh, also all the locations we had. We had zeros here, and now we have things that are not zero. They are actually the values that we want. And also, when we disassemble, we can get some hint in, hints about what this value means. So this is the goose sound that we wanted. And the next one is the C out from the library. And the next one, uh, it's long, but it's the shift left operator for printing. Okay, so now let's take this even a step farther. Uh, we have a huge project. Uh, our Goose library actually doesn't have two files, it has 50. We don't want to list them one by one. We want the, them to package them together into a library. This is what might happen in a larger project. We, we still compile all, all our files as usual, but also we do this archive thing. We put all our files into a single archive, libgoose. And we, then we tell our compiler to uh, look for libraries at the current position and link with libgoose. And again, uh, just to make sure that everything works, yeah, this, it's the same, that's good. Now, the, basically archiving is not that interesting, but um, what is interesting a bit is what happens on this line. Actually, it's interesting to, to ask, how is it that G++, which is kind of, I mean, I used to think it's a compiler, uh, is once being run like this and generating an object file, and then being run like this and generating an executable, but it didn't even compile anything. None of the inputs here are C++ files. And the truth is that G++ is not a compiler. It's a front end for the compiler, but also the linker and also other stuff. And we can, uh, if we want, run G++, oh, let's run the whole command here and give it this nice flag, which tells it, okay, instead of running, just tell me what you're going to run in the backend. <laughs> it's kind of long, but uh, we can look at only the interesting lines. Well, that didn't work as I expected. Okay, uh, let's do it again. So these are actually, this is one log line. One log line that calls a collect to uh, application, which is actually the linker, and then passes all of the flags, including what we said, main.o and libgoose, but also other libraries we didn't even ask for. We have G libgcc, libstd++, and so on and so on. Uh, these are sometimes critical, sometimes you don't want them. For example, in, in embedded environments, you might not want um, well, you want the minimum. You also don't want the whole um, OS stuff and libraries, so you want, might want to remove them. If you're running on standard uh, OS, uh, you still need them. Um, yeah. Go back. Okay, so we saw we saw this. This is not what I want. Well, while I was doing that, I remembered that actually I didn't show everything I wanted. I want to show one last thing. We talked about the code. I forgot to show you about the data. So we did this op jump, um, right, instruct uh, command. We can also do uh, dash t, which shows the symbols. And there are a bunch of symbols. A lot of them are not that interesting, but I guess we do want to see our goose symbols. So we have our function, it's one of the symbols, but also other symbols that are not part of the object file, but it knows about them. It knows that it needs the symbols to see out. It knows that it's undefined. 
Uh, this is the thing that allows the linker in the end to say, okay, um, I have an error. You didn't provide me with all the symbols I was looking for. And also, we should see here our sound. Yeah, we have goose.sound, which is uh, our data that we have. This is marked as O for object and uh, U for unique. Will it work? Yes, it does work. Great. Okay, so we saw some uh, tools. Just um, let's go briefly over it. Yeah. Okay, so we saw that we can link with dash L. Dash L, the, the odd is actually important. So this is kind of the reverse of what you might expect. If you have two libraries and A needs B, then A should be before B. Otherwise, you're going to get an error. I didn't show that. But that also raises a question. What if A needs B and B also needs A? Like you split your library in two. Well, you can just put, put it again. Like you can put dash L A, dash L B, dash L A again. Uh, or you can do this uh, group thing, which tells the linker just try to link this whole thing in this group. It's a bit slow because it has to do multiple passes. And we saw opt dump with dash D to disassemble or dash T to list the symbols. And we have a simple alternative to the opt dump, which is NM. Sometimes it's easier. Okay, so all, most of what I showed is actually from C days. But C++ brings some new things to the table. We have function overloading. We saw that with the name mangling. We also have templates, which also is re resolved by name mangling. Actually, the link doesn't really care about templates. Um, once the templates finish uh, the compilation phase, it's kind of just a generic symbol. Um, we saw name mangling that creates a new problem. Now I have a function in, C in a C file, and I have my C++ file, and I want to call that C function for my C++ file, but it expects a mangled name. So you can tell it, no, don't expect a mangled name. You can declare that other function with text and C. And we have this um, thing that we actually define things in the header file, which is not something we had in C. And this is resolved with the ODR, the one definition rule. It means that if I have, basically in our context, it means that when you include the header, it should be the same header included everywhere. Otherwise, you're going to have trouble because the compiler and the linker will get the same symbol twice from two different sources, might get them. And it needs to know that they can be joined because they're actually the same symbol. Uh, if you're using thread local, it has a special place for it in the linker, a T data section. And also, uh, C allows you to use uh, Unicode identifiers. Like, uh, that's actually a duck, not a goose. But uh, uh, if you want to name your class with uh, Unicode, you can do that. And the linker should support that. Otherwise, it will just crash. Um, by the way, the latest uh, Unicode version also has uh, an emoji for the goose. Okay, so common linker errors. <laughs> well, undefined reference is the king of linker errors. It can be due to a lot of things. Missing library, missing externcy, wrong linkage order. And the tip to remember is that it's kind of the opposite of what you see with include. Uh, if you're linking with different uh, versions of compilers, you might have a problem with the thing called dual ABI before C++11 and after it. And if you have a virtual class, you should have a virtual destructor with it. Um, well, you should have a destructor with it. It has to be defined, even if it's pure virtual. Uh, you might get a multiple definition. It's rare in C++ days. It's more of a C thing. And if you go really, really crazy with types, you might get a linker out of memory uh, error. It's not that rare, um, especially if you're doing link time optimization. Uh, so, you know, we, we want speed, and speed happens in the compiler, well, optimizing for speed. And uh, when we compile files separately, that means we optimize them separately, which is missing an opportunity. So all modern compilers have LTO, link time optimization. For example, GCC supports it like this. You need this flag in the compilation phase and in the link linkage phase, because in the compilation phase, it actually keeps important information for the linker later. And actually, the object file here is not even a real object file. It's kind of an intermediate file for the compiler. And then the linker does an optimization pass. Is it good? Is it actually beneficial? Well, 
there are not a lot of results online, but what, from what I saw, it's not actually obvious that it's good. You get slower link, uh, compilation, slower linkage, and sometimes even a slower executable. Uh, if anyone has a very good like an example where it's actually faster, measurably faster, then I'd be interested to hear about that. Anyway, check for your project. It might be good, it might not be. Uh, shared libraries, we didn't even talk about that. So we have all these things in our main executable. It's kind of a lot. And maybe we can kind of put, take some of them out. For example, all the string library, why should it be in our executable? Everyone is using the same string library. Let's put it in a shared object outside. And the nice thing here is that it's a separate file. It's sometimes part of the OS or installation uh, or installation package. And it's a single file for multiple programs. It should be compiled in a special way which is fully re relocatable because this library is going to be loaded as part of the executable, as part of different executables in different places. So it has to be relocatable. It can't have any absolute addresses. And uh, the problem here is that you have one file in theory, but in practice, if you have different applications compiled with different libraries, you have different versions for those, those libraries, Sorry, and that creates uh, what's called from uh, Windows uh, World DLL hell, where you have this mixture of files and you didn't even actually get anything from doing what, this thing. However, it does allow you to do dynamic loading. Um, so that's when you can load the, li the shared library and link the symbols not as part of the static compilation, or not even as part of loading the program. It can be lazy. It can be the first time a, a method is accessed, it will load then. There are tricks to do that. Or you can do it as part of, of your program, like loading a plugin, but then you have to start looking at symbols. It's complicated. Last small thing I want to talk about, uh, wrapping. So we have this main.o and we have our libgoose and, you know, main points to talk, and talk to points to the sound object. But maybe in the last step, we actually get some libduck and we want to replace them. We don't want it to go to libgoose, we want to go, it to, go to libduck. Can we do this thing? Can we just kind of redirect our call? Or maybe we can leave our call like it was, but then inside the talk, somehow redirect it to the sound from the duck. So it's kind of possible more or less, when we link in the last stage, we can tell the, the linker, um, instead of doing the usual symbol resolution that you know how to do, uh, do something more complicated. This symbol, this goose sound, the unmangled symbol, just go ahead and instead of calling it, call a wrapper object. It's called wrap, but actually it doesn't even have to wrap the original one, it can just be an alternative. And this has some caveats, um, but despite those caveats, which don't ensure anything in practice, we'll, we'll try it. Why not? Okay. Um. okay. So let's... Um, do the object dump and also look for the sound, not demangle it actually, and look for the sound object. And this is the this is the symbol of the sound object. And then we can well I need to kind of uh, cheat by um, taking the last instruction, copying it because I don't remember it. Okay. We'll do the linkage phase again. But this time we'll also say wrap this thing. So this will tell, first of all, this tells G++ the front end, pass an instruction, a command to the linker, and the linker wrap this function, which again means the when we see code that needs this symbol, just go and take another symbol. The symbol is underscore underscore wrap underscore this symbol. But where is that thing? I actually already have it. Uh, it's, it's, it's in a file that which I didn't show, but it's here. Or, you know, it might just not work because I have too many dashes. Or it might not work because I don't actually have this file for some reason. So I have this uh, 
the, the goose is a duck uh, thing, and I thought I compiled it, but I guess I didn't. So let's just do that now. Yeah, thanks. OK, so the goose is a duck. I didn't actually show it, but uh, it, just, it just provides this alternative symbol. Uh, and let's do that um, compilation again, linkage. Oh, yeah, I didn't actually put it in, in here. I, I need to do that as well. I need to provide. Right. <laughs> you know how it is that uh, at home everything works, and then on stage it doesn't. Uh, so let's just see if we can quickly diagnose this thing. So in the function. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, right, like just this should. Uh, yeah, well, I ruined that. Um, let's recompile it. And yeah, okay, we got that. So w let's see what happens. That, that fifty percent worked, right? The first one somehow didn't get replaced, but the second one did. And uh, well, it's, it, it makes sense because we do have some caveats. Um, with this thing. So we did, I did two things that are kind of wrong here, because I mean, I tried, but well, that doesn't, that's not what I want to do. So first of all, uh, we're trying to hijack inside the library, right? This talk thing um, was supposed to uh, point, oh, was supposed to point to the sound that we try to hijack inside the library. That's kind of a problem. It's a problem, especially if we have optimizations. In this case, we don't have, but still, it's, you can't even ensure that you can hijack from inside the library. Uh, the second one is that we're actually trying to hijack not a function, but a, a symbol, which is an object. That's also not something in the documentation. And the last one, probably not relevant here, but you should know, hijacking class methods is complicated. You have the this parameter, the object, the instance, and that makes things much more complicated because the hijacking function, the other the alternative function, needs to somehow match the same object and at least not crash on it. Okay, but uh, it's still nice. Why is it used, like, uh, in, what in which uh, normal scenarios you want to use this? Okay, so you can use it in uh, testing environments if you want to, for example, maybe your program accesses the system clock and you want to fake a system clock. That might be a good place to do that. Uh, whether you want to use this uh, method, or you can also replace the dynamic loading, that's another option. Depends on your scenario. So for, for like static symbols, which don't have state like this, it's way easier. So it's a good way to override some. It, it's a good way to override, but it has some risk. It's not perfect. It's not production uh, code, probably. OK, thank you very much. And um, <laughs> see you. Oh, uh, we have time for a question or two, if if there is. Any. Okay. Uh, have a great conference, everyone. Oh, yeah. Any idea why Windows need to have the export or the dev file and the Linux? We don't need it. Okay, so the question is about Windows, which is already something I don't really know about. Why we had the deal with export, I think, but don't catch me if I'm wrong here. Um, uh, I think we have in the object format for Linux, the ELF or Dwarf format, uh, some information which in the file for the Windows is just not part of the file format, so it's just kind of separate. If you're talking about dynamic libraries, then the export is kind of the symbols you have to export. This is attributes in the Linux format, which you can say in the source code. But I'm not an expert on Windows. Thank you.